Well, hello, hello everyone. We are going to uh, start a session of Ask Me Anything. And uh, we have Mark with us. And he's coming from uh, Melbourne. He's the creator, co-creator of uh, CSS modules. Also the lead organizer of uh, Melm JS, like Melbourne JS um, community. And uh, he's the lead infrastructure for SIG. Um, Front end. OK. <laughs> and um, yeah, um, so thanks for, uh, th thanks for joining us here in this session. We're going to uh, take some questions from um, Slido and uh, also some questions from you in the audience. So if you have any questions, we will uh, jump and take some of yours. Uh, let's take the first one. So you just released uh, today Playroom. That's uh, really exciting. And um, is this only available for React? Can you ex expand on that? Yeah. Um, right now, it's only available for React. It is version 0.1. Um, and it's very much extracted from the tool that we built internally, as I talked about in my talk. Um, but it's definitely not, uh, long term doesn't have to be coupled to React. It's coupled to the idea of JSX, I would say. Okay. So as long as the library that you're using um, can be built out of JSX, in theory we could add support, but that'll be some ways down the road if we get to that. Awesome. Well, um, just to introduce um, Mark, he was covering an interesting talk bridging um, the developer experience with uh, the designer uh, experience and how it could improve uh, the workflow with, between developers and designers. And I guess that's uh, one of the main uh, efforts that you, are, that you are working on. Yeah. Well, it's... it's in a lot of ways, it's still kind of the hardest part of the job, I think, in the sense that, especially if you're new to a company, um, you know, it's, it's really hard to get a sense of how do you build a UI that honors the look and feel of a, of a given brand. Um, I've gone to companies before where they've had literally nothing in this space in terms of guidance, and all you could do was copy and paste code from other parts of the code base. Um, and I think... For me, uh, when React came along and that, that, that extreme focus on components, that was where I felt like we finally had the beginnings of you know, how we could actually solve this problem properly. Um, and so ever since then, I've really made it my focus to try and create component libraries that bridge that divide so that developers are able to communicate better with designers and vice versa. And um, all the effort that we put into that space just pay, continues to pay off. It's, it's a really rewarding space. And I think I'm, I'm by far not alone in that. Like, everyone's looking into this space at the moment for, for this reason. Yeah, I would say there's quite a lot of hype around um, the tools that you also introduced during your talk. I'm totally going to check some of those tools. Um, let's see if we get a question from the audience here. Any? Anyone wants to uh, ask a question? Well, if you want, okay, if you want, you can still use um, the Slido um, hash. So it's hash uh, reactive comms 18. So at any point during this AMA, you can uh, write your questions there and we will pick them up. Um, so one, we can pick uh, one of the questions over there. Oh, that's, a, that's a really hard question to answer. I mean, it obviously, it really depends on your context. But I, to be honest, I, I feel like design systems are one of those things that they begin, they begin solving a problem that you have at scale. But then once you get comfortable with that way of working, you actually find it almost impossible to go back to 
you know, working in a way that you, you don't have that anymore. Um, so I would, like, if I go through a thought exercise, if I, if I created a startup tomorrow, right, I'd still be tempted to try and get some minimal form of design system in there from the beginning. And the reason why is because I find it, it, it empowers you to be able to iterate really fast. And I, and I think that's actually it. So it's, it's a different problem. It's not a problem of scale. It's a problem of being able to change your mind really quickly, which is also very valuable at small scale early on in a company's life, for example. Um, and tools like Playroom that I showed in my talk, like that's part of why I built it was to try and really visualize how quickly you can iterate once you have a good design system um, at your disposal. So uh, yeah, I don't think it's necessarily a problem of scale. I just come up with a question myself, <laughs> if you don't mind. What are the first reactions when you um, introduce these um, new tools in a, in a team which is already using maybe other, other means? Um, generally positive if you're, if you're solving a real problem. Okay. Um, so the sketch uh, integration that I showed earlier, that was definitely solving a real problem, which was you know, static, design, uh, static style guides going stale um, and requiring a lot of work to keep them up to date. For the design team to know that pretty much at the push of a button, we could completely update the entire suite of components across all the different screen sizes, um, you know, there's nothing but positive feedback to that. Like, people are blown away by it. Um, Playroom, likewise, was kind of solving this problem of, you know, as a developer, you want to be able to quickly iterate on a design out of components, but you want to do it on kind of a blank slate. Um, often what people would do is they would have to create some temporary space within their app to start to iterate on some design, and they wanted to be able to have a bit more of that blank slate. And it also served as a, um, it solved another problem, which was if a designer comes to a developer with a mock-up of a, of a given page that we might want to create, um, one of the challenges with a design system is you, you kind of first want to see, like, OK, how far can I get out of only standard components that are already in the system? And having a tool to be able to, be able to kind of sit the designer next to you at the laptop and say, OK, I'm going to try and translate this into code as quickly as I can, and we'll, and we'll see how far I can get. Um, and, and the fact that the, the fact that all you were writing was JSX, it actually made the code relatively readable to non-developers. Um, they could, even, like, as long as they're familiar with the basic syntax of HTML, because that's kind of what it resembles, um, you can quickly get an idea of, of how your design system functions, even if you're not a developer. So, I found it's, it's again, if you're, if you're solving these real problems, um, people tend to, re to react really positively, yeah. So actually, it's um, helping the communication not only from uh, developers to designers, but then you are also saying that designers can find a way to communicate better with developers. Yeah. By using new, new screens, new uh, composition from the um, available controls, and then show these to the developer team so they can then focus in a really uh, concise uh, way. Yeah, I think the, where I get most excited is when the tools like blur those boundaries. So I think both the tools that I, you know, our open source tools that I talked about today, you can see that they're blurring those lines in different directions. Like it's trying to bring code into the design environment and trying to make it so that as a designer, I have access to the React components, in a sense. Um, and then you're going the other way, which is how can I create tools for developers that are actually closer to design tools and the way you think about the way you work with them? Um, and trying to get, how do we get developers to think a little bit more like designers and vice versa? Yeah, that's really awesome. Let's take another question from, uh, from Slido. So do you do acceptance tests for your UI components? And if so, what tools do you use? Um, the question mentions Protractor and Backstop. And when do you introduce them? Um, I would say acceptance tests are an area where we're still not that mature, I think, in terms of our own um, setup. Uh, we use Jest and Snapshot tests, which is obviously a very different thing, um, to get a lot of like baseline coverage. Um, one thing I'm looking into at the moment um, is uh, using Storybook as a testing environment hooked up to 
I haven't actually finished this yet, I'm working on it at the moment, um, hooking it up to a, a, a service called um, Chromatic, which some of you might be familiar with. It, it does uh, visual snapshot testing of your components. So you, you define your stories in Storybook, and for each one of those, it'll take a screenshot, and then it does the, um, in GitHub, when you're doing a pull request, it will notify you if any of your screenshots have changed, and you can go through and um, you have to approve those visual changes. Um, that's something that we, we've kind of got by without bef uh, before, but w I, I alluded to it briefly in my talk that we're starting to build out a themed design system where there's, there's, yeah, there's multiple themes for every single component. And this is the, I think we've crossed that threshold where at that, you know, when you've got every single permutation of every component for every theme, I really need to actually see for every pull request if anything's changed and have to, to approve it. Um, so that's sort of where we are at the moment with that sort of thing. So that's very, very close to the developer experience. So you, yeah. you have design commits in a way. Maybe uh, then you can see the progress. Uh, but, even, but even that, I think what's interesting about that is I think if, if a pull request triggers a visual change, to me that's a clear point at which a designer probably should be pulled in, right? A lot yes. of the, the challenge with trying to get designers across all the work that's happening is there's a lot of irrelevant noise uh, in GitHub if you're a designer. You know, like if, if I'm just, uh, you know, adding a, creating a pull request to like add prettier to the project, like they don't care. And why should they care about that? Um, but if I'm changing the UI, they probably want to know about it. And so having some kind of service that can actually pick up when the relevant um, aspect of your project has changed is really valuable there. Cool. Any other questions from the people here? No? OK. We take another one from uh, Slido. Um, so how you can uh, best convince you know, a team of uh, designers to adopt this kind of approach? Uh, it seems like they, they will give up some control. Like the ownership from the design, it's moving, shifting a little bit on the developer side. Yeah, I think. I think this is just a natural tension that's never going to go away between, like, to some degree, a designer's job is to be a little bit creative, and sometimes they can get carried away with the creativity, um, and it's hard. It's a, it's a hard thing to do, and, and I think it's what's hard as well is that it's not necessarily clear when they make a change what they're actually technically proposing as a change. So, for example, if you're using our sketch library and you're pulling in symbols, um, they might not realize once they're in, the, in the, the zone of kind of designing this new screen that if they take this label and move it over here, it's like you're actually proposing a change to this component. Um, and when you hand that to a developer, that developer now has to kind of reverse engineer this proposal to, as a, of a change you're making to the system. And um, sometimes it's not even a, an issue of convincing them. It's actually just that there's this, this learning curve to the way it uh, they have to work now. And, and I think it's still something I'm struggling with. I think everyone working in the space struggles with this. And I, I think that's what a lot of these new tools are trying to do, is trying to make it so that the design tool is actually has some understanding of, of these contracts, so that when I drag a component onto the, the canvas in a tool like FramerX, it actually maintains that knowledge of the fact that it's an instance of a certain component, and that component has props, some of which are Boolean, some of which are enums, that kind of thing. Um, you know, at the moment, with our traditional illustration tools, all of that context you lose. So, um, I don't know. I don't have an answer to this, really. <laughs> it's just an ongoing problem. Yeah, it's not that easy. Okay. So, we will take another question. Um, how do you suggest to close the gap between design and development in terms of exporting a design uh, from a sketch to code? Like, the, I think it's the opposite way. Um, my feeling is that, and then this is just my own take, but I, I feel like this whole idea of, of going from sketch back to code is kind of a pipe dream. I think we need to let it go. <laughs> um, it will be really cool. The problem is that when you're in something like sketch, it is so detached from the real medium. Um, you know, think of, think of all the concerns that you have to go through as a front-end developer. Um, there's a lot more to it than just visually what it looks like. I know I don't have to tell you that, right? But, um, 
you know, issues like cross-browser support, accessibility, performance. Um, if you start pulling in third-party libraries, right, like we've, got, we've had people today showing tools like Rx, right? Like if I'm pulling Rx into my component, how, how does a design tool like represent what I'm doing with Rx? Like it's just a completely different domain. Um, I, the only way I can kind of wrap my head around that being possible is if we essentially go back to the idea that it's not a design tool, it's a, it's a WYSIWYG editor. Like, it, it, it has a code pane that you can open. Like, I think tools like Flash had a better balance, to be honest, of this idea that, that design and code need to kind of coexist in the one tool. This, if, if you try to separate them and say that you've got a design tool over here and it should kind of export code, it's like the, the model is wrong. That's, that's my feeling. So as I understand it, it's more like a communication tool and kind of a tracking, keeping you know, progress really, really close to what you expect from it. Well, I think the, the challenge that we find with tools like Sketch, or trying to improve on tools like Sketch, is that they're, they're built for a different part of the life cycle. Like, so designers have basically complete freedom when they're using a tool like Sketch. Like, they can just draw whatever they want. And to, to developers, that's a real frustration because we often get these designs that we look at and we go, well, what, like you've just invented half of this stuff and I don't know what to do with it. Um, but the, the flip side of that is like if you try to solve that by saying, okay, we're going to make a design tool where you can't just draw whatever you want. You have to pull from a component library. You can't just absolute position everything. You have to nest components within other components. Um, and you hand that to a designer, and it's just too constraining. Like they, they're at that period where they they need that complete freedom to kind of just draw different things and see what sticks. And 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 I can say that as someone who's even I, I've I've experimented with some of these new tools, and okay. I find it a bit frustrating that you know you, I'm basically trying to use it as a glorified pen and paper. You know, like pen and paper is good because you can just scribble and just kind of try things, and you don't have to go at the speed of actually typing something out. You can just be really fast. And if your design tool suddenly slows you right down because it's trying to ground you in reality almost too much, um, there, there's a trade-off there. So it, it's really hard. I think tools like FramerX, um, like FramerX does a really good job of trying to balance these two concerns. Like it, it's really fluid even though it's component-based, but that comes with some trade-offs. Like it, it's still in that unca uncanny valley where it, you're using components and it looks very realistic, but it's not like you could ship it to production. It's still full of kind of fake framer stuff that they've included, um, like transitions and things where like those transitions might not be part of your design system. And so now what? Um, so I don't know. There's a lot, there's a lot to this <laughs> question, obviously, but yeah. I have another question for you. <laughs> so what would be the main um, improvements so by using these uh, new tools, what do you think that it changes on the way the, the teams work? You think there's an improvement on the quality of the final result or maybe some efficiency? Um, well, the, the, the number one thing that I think we need to improve on is getting designers and developers to actually work closer together. Um, like, I, I really don't like the focus that some tooling um, puts on on this like they call handoff features like they try to optimize this phase of basically d a designer throwing something over the wall and um, we, even, like I, I'm trying to make tooling that I mean in some I guess could be abused and could be used for that but I you know so playroom for example is a tool that I created to try and get the design process and the development process to kind of meet somewhere in the middle so it's, a, it's actually a tool that I built for designers and developers to pair on, right? Like, that's kind of where it, it, it shines. Um, it, it's not really made for it. Like, it, a designer wouldn't really enjoy the tool, and a developer probably might not go to it all that often. But when you've got a designer and developer sitting together, it's actually a really good medium for that. Um, so, yeah, the more we can get into the final medium faster and iterate together, I think it, that, that's where the biggest improvements come from. So they may come up with different ideas if they are sitting together using these tools that they would do separately. Yeah, because if you think about this scenario, right, where the designer might have done the quick sketch of potentially even on paper, right, of like, here's some ideas I have for the screen. If you then sit the designer and the developer together in an environment where you can iterate quickly, so again, assuming you have a good design system, um, you can go pretty far pretty quickly. 
Um, but even if you, like, so that's the thing, even if you don't have a fully featured design system yet, this sort of tooling helps surface that because you, in theory, you should be able to iterate quickly. And if not, it's like you can talk to the designer, like, what am I missing here in terms of, like, if, if, you, if you're scribbling on a piece of paper, like, what are the things in your head that you assume we have? We should build those things out so we can move quickly. Um, and so you can almost like help to, even if you're not quite there yet, a tool like this can help surface the gaps in your system. OK. So let's see. We're getting a, an audience that don't push it too much. OK, let's see if we get some questions. Um, you can go ahead. Um, well, I think that's sort of, in some sense, that's what I'm getting at in, in, in that what, I'd, what I like to do is try, and, and it's hard, but try to, try to minimize the amount of time that's spent in this absolute positioning, like anything goes phase. Because I think the problem, with, the problem with this hard separation between design and development that a lot of us kind of deal with is that you end up with a designer kind of being off in their own world for days and days and days on end with no constraints, and what you're talking about, like a complete disconnect from what the final medium's doing. Um, I think that's actually a, a really good uh, driver for us to invest more in our design systems so that we can have a compelling reason why they shouldn't do that. It's like, if, if the development process is slow and tedious, it's like, well, yeah, that's kind of, I think for a lot of companies, that's why this um, split has occurred. Because if a designer ever tried to sit down with a developer and pair, it took forever. And if they changed their mind, that took forever again. Um, and again, so like I said before, if you've got a system that allows them to iterate quickly, um, and, and, and tools like Playroom, I know I'm going on about it, but like one of the reasons why I created that tool as well is because it, it helps sell the value of design systems to the entire organization. Because you can sit down and show them, like what you think of as being a slow kind of design process that might take a designer a while off in one corner, it's like, look, I can literally type a few you know, c components out, and I can get a responsive design happening very fast. Um, so yeah, if, I think we've just got to invest in the, the, the systems and the tooling so that we can create a compelling case for designers to, to work with us closer more often. OK. Yeah. Uh, we have another question, please. Custom, custom form controls, like forms. Uh, the uh, a necessary evil, I guess. Like, it, I can see why, particularly from a visual design standpoint, you wouldn't want to just go with stock standard native form controls. They visually, they're still straight out of the '90s. And I wish we had a better answer than, than creating fake ones, but. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> We've got all this other crazy stuff in the platform, but our form controls are still from the mid 90s. Don't know why. Forms will be forms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, yeah, we have another question. Cool. Um, I'm not that experienced in them, to be honest. I think there's a, there's a fundamental challenge with those that I find, which is that there's a bit of a, a, bit of a conflict in terms of, like, for, for us, our design system is about capturing our own design language, our, our company's design language. And um, it, we desperately need to just not look like a theme on top of some other system. Like, we, it needs to very much be our design language. And we need to have complete freedom over it, too, because what we're, tr what we're trying to do right, is we, like, we've got a, a design team, a visual design team, who are constantly evolving the, the design language of our company. And then we're trying to accurately capture that um, in a system. I think we've had a false start 
a number of years back when we actually had some developers tried to adopt Bootstrap. So obviously that's from a different generation uh, slightly, but um, you know, it's the same kind of idea, which is like we shouldn't reinvent the wheel. We should use an existing system and then tweak it a little bit. But the, the problem is that it was like um, it was like an organ transplant that failed, right? It was like you take this third-party thing and you, would, you, you stick it on the company and the designers don't know what to do with it. Like, it, it, they weren't really involved in the decision. It was purely a developer, like, optimization, trying to use this third-party thing. And it just looked and felt like bootstrap and then customizing it was just this huge mess of variables and overrides and things. And so the code base wasn't that clean, really. And... Um, it ended up not really working for us. And I think building your own system, it, it just, it's obviously more work, but it, the payoff is that what you end up with is very much like your brand, which is the whole point of, of I think, visual design at the end of the day, is trying to, trying to convey your brand very distinctly. Um, but I think, it, I think it, the, the flip side of that is if you can get complete buy-in that this is the way to go. So I think you'll have an easier time if, say, it's a startup and it's like there's like not a whole lot of designers around, and maybe maybe the designer you have is technical and can kind of buy into this idea that like we should minimise the amount of work in this space early on. You know, so again, it's all about whether you can make it fit with your design culture or not, I think is the key, the key question there. I have one question <clears throat> spinning off your, yours. Um, there's any reference um, sketch library that you could recommend for people that want to go this, uh, following this path? A sketch library? A component A library. A component library. Um, that they can see you know, how you can you know, split your application in different components? Um, it was touched on a little bit earlier today. I think the ones that I like the most are the lower level, more utility level ones, so like styled system. They're cool because they, they're trying to get that middle ground of like, they're, they're trying to give you the building blocks to create your own system. So at least when you go to create a system, you're not down at the lowest level trying to create primitives. You've at least got a base level of, of um, you know, components to use. I think th those are the ones that I'd say to, to look at first. Cool. Let's take another, another question. We still have a couple of minutes more. With keeping the designs in sync um, with your code, how do you see the roles and responsibilities both for designers and uh, developers? Um, this is a big question. Uh, I, I don't even know where to start. I, uh, what I would say is that, um, like, so one of the challenges that we're facing where I work is that previously to, to, to make design scale, what we did was we would put a visual designer in every team, and that made sense for where we were, and that, that is actually still where we are. But I, I kind of think that that model doesn't actually work as well in the world of design systems. I, I actually feel like once you cross that threshold to investing in design systems, you almost need to get the visual designers out of the teams and put them on a product team of the design system and, and have more of a model of, like, they work on the system full time and then they act almost as customer support. Like, they'll go out into the teams um, as, as almost consultants, right? Like, helping them adopt the system and make use of it and get that feedback loop of, you know, our component system isn't working as well as we thought. It's, it, the, the web pages that people are building with it maybe aren't as good as what we had expected, and so we'll feed that back into some iteration on the system. Um, and so that means that visual design uh, as, as a skill set needs to be focused more on systems than on pages. But that's a, that's a transition that's kind of hard to make, and I think it's a very different way of thinking, and not a lot of designers are necessarily prepared for it. So it's, it's a tricky one, but I, I, I think that that's the big shift that needs to happen. And uh, on the side of developers? On the side of developers. Um, I think developers need to treat design more seriously if they want to solve this problem well. Um, in, in the world of design, we have this um, idea of domain-driven design, which is to say that if you, want to, if you want to make your code work well in any given domain, you need to make sure that you properly understand it and model it correctly. And I think it's, it's exactly the same idea with design. Like, you need to talk, if you're going to build a design system, you need to talk to designers a lot and really get inside their head and understand 
what are the moving parts within the system and how can I as accurately as possible capture them in the code? Um, you know, that's very different to the historical way we would work, which is you'd get a, a picture of what the page should look like and then you just hack some stuff until it resembled the picture. And you wouldn't really worry too much about, is my terminology the same terminology that the designer uses? Like you, a lot of people just wouldn't even think to ask that question. They'd name the class, slap the class on the div and move on. You can't, you can't think that way in the world of design systems. You have to talk to designers a lot. I think as developers, we, uh, we have seen a lot of success on uh, uh, tools like Storybook. And uh, I think we all love these tools. And uh, it improves, I think, uh, the, whole, the whole process. So we have um, probably time for a last question. And then we, uh, we will wrap up. So isn't it better to teach designers to use GSX uh, and using components to iterate on the style guide? Would that be a good idea? Uh, this is my dream. <laughs> I think this is the, uh, the ulterior motive of creating Playroom, is to try and create a design tool that's, as, that's based on JSX that is as approachable as possible to non-developers. There's obviously going to be a learning curve if, if, by its very nature. If you're going to require people to type out JSX to design a screen, there is that learning curve there. But I've tried to, to make it as straightforward as possible. So that, like, the biggest decision I made is the fact that you just write JSX. You don't write a React component you know, from the point of view of the user. Like, under, the, under the hood, of course, it turns it into a React component. But they don't have to know that. Like, they just, all they need to know is the JSX. And I think JSX is pretty straightforward. I, I don't think it's a, it's a tall order to say that you know, designers of the future maybe should be learning JSX. But we'll see. I'm working on it. <laughs> Nice, awesome. So please, on to whoever asked that question or anyone else, please see if you can introduce your designers to JSX. Playroom is designed for that. So if you have any feedback on how well that's working, please let me know, and we'll see what we can do. OK. So that was the last question. Of course, Mark will be around for the next couple of days. Um, She's really, uh, he's really kind to answer any questions that you may have. So uh, you can approach him. Um, if you come up with new questions, you can go and ask him. And uh, that will be all for this um, Ask Me Anything session. Thanks a lot for being here. See you around.